Well, thank you, Brother Chairman, and good morning, my dearly loved brethren and sisters and our Lord Jesus Christ. I bring with me, of course, the love of your brothers and sisters of Tea Tree Gully. And of course, I'm as aware as any of you, as I speak to a camera this morning, of the uh, trying times that we're enduring during the moment of the crisis of the virus internationally. And it's interesting, you know, as we start to look at uh, a word of exhortation, such as we've shelled this morning from this psalm, that we're doing so in the seclusion of our own homes. And therefore, we can't easily talk to one another about... Uh, the things that we're going to consider. And so perhaps you'll find this exhortation helpful in the forthcoming week as we walk with David through an episode of his life which was very trying. This is a story I think you'll find as we continue that you know very well. And after we've finished this morning, you might like to go back over the story, uh, get out books, go through the various records we consider, savour the words and live with David through the story, because you've got the time to do that now, uh, perhaps that you wouldn't have normally had in the busyness of life before these events came upon us. Well, of course, as our chairman has mentioned, we're going to look at Psalm 34 this morning by way of exhortation. This is a very well-known psalm to us, and perhaps even as we read it together, some verses may have jumped out of you, some verses that you know well, I think, for example, of verse 7, the angel of Yahweh encampeth about them that fear him and delivereth them. It's a well, well-known well verse. Or verse 15, the eyes of Yahweh are upon the righteous, his ears are open to their cry. Or that great messianic verse of verse 20, he keepeth all his bones and not one of them's broken. So it's a well-known psalm. But the reason we want to consider the psalm this morning is because the story behind the psalm makes it extremely relevant for us and relevant for a consideration really on any Sunday morning. This is a psalm of David. And when the psalm was first recited by David, it was to those 400 men in the cave of Adullam, high up in the hills of the Judean wilderness, as Saul was seeking refuge from the onslaught of... Sorry, as David was seeking refuge from the onslaught of Saul... For various reasons, those 400 men had gathered themselves to David because they didn't fit into the society around them. And they sought sanctuary with David because, as we said, of the persecutions of their age. Persecutions instituted by Saul. And here we are in a very similar manner in our age. Gathered together from all walks of life to a community with two major things in common. Firstly, our dissatisfaction with the world about us, and secondly, our belief that the solution to the problems of the world about us lies with the greater than David, in our case, the Lord Jesus Christ. But the power of our gathering together this morning is not just in the fact that we have a common problem and a common need, but the fact that these words of David may help us to become more like the greater than David. And that's really the goal. You see, this psalm is based upon the experiences of David, which he conveyed to those who came to hear him. In fact, this was a very low and a very embarrassing point of David's life. The central theme of the psalm, Psalm 34, is found in one word, and it's the word fear. And you read that word five times in the psalm. Verse 4. I sought Yahweh and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Just colour in the word fears. Verse 7, the angel of Yahweh encampeth about them that fear him. Verse 9, twice. O oh, fear Yahweh, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. And then finally, verse 11. Come ye children, hearken unto me, I'll teach you the fear of Yahweh. See, there's the five occurrences of the word fear in this psalm. But this is very important because you've got to understand one thing. David was not a man normally given to fear. There wasn't much in life that actually made David afraid, that he couldn't deal with. But in the background of the events of this psalm, we're going to find that David tells us he was sore afraid. It's a quotation from uh, 1 Samuel 21 verse 12. 
he was sore afraid. So that's the fear of the psalm. And the significance, of course, as we'll shortly see in 1 Samuel 21, is that David thought he was going to die. That's why he was afraid. He really believed he was going to die. And this is the story of the psalm, you see, because what began as the fear of man very quickly became the fear of God. Now look at those fears that I just showed you, those five occurrences of the word fear. Verse 4, I sought Yahweh and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Well, the fears of verse 4, is it the fear of man or the fear of God? Well, clearly it's the fear of man because Yahweh delivers him from that fear. But now look at verse uh, verse 7. The angel of Yahweh encamped around about them that fear him, well, as the fear of God. Verse 9, O fear Yahweh, fear of God, ye his saints. There's no want to them that fear him. And then verse 11, Come, ye children, I'll teach you the fear of Yahweh. So you see, verse 4 is the fear of man. Verse 7, 9, 9, 11 is all the fear of God. So what began as the fear of man became the fear of God. So it's not just a psalm about fear in that sense. There are two fears here. And there's a development, you see, that happened to David in the context of this psalm. And understanding that helps you now appreciate the purpose of the psalm because the psalm is simply broken into two halves. Verses 1 to 10 are the first half, David's personal experience. Verses 11 to 22... David's instruction to others. And you can see that from verse 11. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I'll teach you something. And what he's going to teach them, of course, is the fear of Yahweh. Well, what went wrong? Why did we get to this? How come this psalm came into being? Well, the story of what went wrong is contained in the superscription of the psalm. A psalm of David, it tells us, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. So there's the background of the psalm. Now these words, this this, uh, superscription, of course, is an inspired commentary on the psalm. These words are actually part of the psalm. Now you might have heard that before, but could you prove that? You might like, just as we take an aside for a moment, uh, to, to appreciate a proof of the fact that the superscription of the psalm is actually part of the psalm. You come back a few pages with me to Psalm 18. Now, of course, Psalm 18 also has a superscription. Uh, but the significance of Psalm 18 is that it is repeated verbatim in 2 Samuel 22. So we have a chapter of history and a psalm, and they are copies of each other, Psalm 18 and 2 Samuel 22. The superscription of Psalm 18 says this, A psalm of David, the servant of Yahweh, who spake to Yahweh the words of the song in the day that Yahweh delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. That is 2 Samuel 22, verse 1. So you see, the historical record of the psalm <clears throat> includes the superscription of the psalm as the first verse. And you'd have no difficulty appreciating 2 Samuel 22 verse 1 was inspired. Also, likewise, the superscription of Psalm 34 is really verse 0 of Psalm 34. And the point of that is that we're left in no doubt as to what the background of Psalm 34 is. We have an inspired commentary on the background of the psalm. And it was the days, of course, where David went to Achish, the king of Gath. Now, of course, the superscription doesn't say that. It says this is the time that David changed his behavior before Abimelech. But we know in the Samuel record, 1 Samuel 21, that it wasn't Abimelech, it was Achish. So what do you make of that? Well, you remember the occasion. David was fleeing for his life from Saul And so he flees to the Philistines in 1 Samuel 21. He pretended to be mad in the house of Achish, the king of Gath, scrabbling upon the wall, dribbling down his beard, and so forth. And Achish is called, as it were, in this psalm, Abimelech in the superscription. Why? Well, we believe Abimelech was actually a title, whereas Achish was the man's name. Abimelech means, my father is king. Abi, Melech, father, king. My father is king. 
In the course of the days before democracy, all kings became kings because their father was the king. Abimelech is a typically Philistine name. You read, for example, of an Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Genesis 20, verse 2, in the life of Abraham. You read of another one in Genesis 26, verse 1, in the life of Isaac. So Abimelech was a title that Philistine kings took, even though they had conventional names. So it's Achish, actually, but here called Abimelech. And the story, of course, is that miraculously David escaped from the hand of Achish. Achish didn't have David killed when he probably should have done, humanly speaking, and when many people of Gath probably wanted to him to have done. But miraculously, David escapes. And I say miraculously because David certainly expected to die in the Philistine jail that he was in, in Gath. Oh yes, he thought he was a good actor. He thought he could trick the Philistines into thinking that he was insane. I don't think they were fooled. I don't think they thought they, that David was insane. And I think that David realized that after a short time. And of course, that exposes the next great theme of this psalm. The first theme was fear. The second theme is deliverance. And four times the word deliverance also occurs in this psalm. You read it in verse 4. I sought Yahweh, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Verse 7, the angel of Yahweh encampeth about them that fear him, and delivereth them. Verse 17, the righteous cry, and Yahweh heareth, and delivereth them. And then verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but Yahweh delivereth them out of them all. So fear and deliverance are the twin themes of the psalm. And you see the power of that. What began as the fear of man soon became the fear of God because deliverance did not come by the hand of man, that is, by David's own arm, but by the hand of God. It was a miraculous deliverance that David had from the Philistines in 1 Samuel 21. Now come back with me to 1 Samuel 21. Look what really happened. Here's the uh, background to which this psalm was written. 1 Samuel 21 and verse 1. 1 Samuel 21 verse 1. Then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone, David, and no man with thee? And so the story begins. David's fleeing from Saul for his life. He's just been told by Jonathan in chapter 20 that Saul really does mean to kill him and that there's nothing Jonathan can do to moderate the emotions of his father. And so now David runs for his life. When David fled from Saul last time, back in chapter 19 of 1 Samuel, he ran to, he ran to Samuel at Ramah. This time he runs to the high priest at Nob. And you can see... David's heart's in the right place as he commences this chapter. He's got a problem in life, and so he seeks refuge with the people of God, with the high priest, no less. And this is an important point, of course, because David did have other resources available to him. I mean, it wasn't long after this that he's able to, to gather 400 men to his side and form an army, an army of probably very capable men who were extremely dissatisfied with Saul's leadership. If David had sent out a call to arm, there might have been thousands that, have, that would have come to his side. He could have started a civil war. And of course, at any tick of the clock, he could have killed Saul. But he doesn't. He does the right thing, as it were. He flees. He goes to the priests. Nob, the city of Nob, was on the natural route between Bethlehem, where David lived, and Gibeah, where Saul lived. So no doubt David had been to Bethlehem many times and had spoken to this high priest many times. But what began as a good intention quickly degenerated. Abimelech in verse 1 asks David why he's come, and David lies. Verse 2, David said unto Ahimelech the priest, The king has commanded me a business, and has said to me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, David, and what I've commanded thee, and I've appointed my servants to such and such a place. 
Well, it was true that David had servants. He did have other people with him. Jesus says so in Matthew 12, verse 3. In fact, you might reason from verse 3 of the psalm, where David asks for five loaves of showbread, that in fact he had four others with him. He could have asked for 12 loaves, couldn't he? Only asks for five. But the story about being on the king's business in verse 2, oh, that was a complete fabrication. That was an outright lie. Now, there have been various reasons proposed for the reasons uh, for David's lie in verse 2. But I don't think there's any doubt about why he lied in verse 2. Because I think the record supplies the answer all by itself. It's in verse 7. There was a certain man of the servants of Saul there that day, detained before Yahweh. His name was Doeg an Edomite, the chiefest of the herdmen that belonged to Saul. Oh, that's very serious in verse 7. Chief of the herdmen. Now, don't don't misunderstand that phrase. That is not saying that Doeg was just a chief shepherd. He was the chiefest of the herdmen. In fact, he was an extremely powerful member of Saul's cabinet. He was part of Saul's inner circle. He was helping run the country. Like the minister of agriculture, he wasn't just a shepherd. He had the king's ear, and David very well knew that. And instantly David panics, and this is the reason for the lie. He's gone to the priests, probably to find out what God would have him to do next. He knows he can't kill Yahweh's anointed, but he's just got to keep running and dodging the arrows from Saul. There were 85 priests at Nob, and David has managed to get to the high priest straight away, alone, in a meeting. So I think he was pinning his hopes on the outcome of this discussion in verse 1. But the moment he gets there, he finds an enemy waiting for him. So he's alarmed. He's desperate. He doesn't know what to do. What he does know is that the moment he leaves this city, Doeg will report him. And so he makes up a story being on his secret business of the king. And that would be why Doeg wouldn't know why David had come. Because it was secret business. In fact, the business was evidently so urgent that David didn't have time to to take food. So critically urgent, it would appear he didn't even have time to arm himself with a weapon. So look at verse 8. David said to Ahimelech, And Ahimelech, is there not here under thine hand a, a spear or a sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. So what do you think David's asking for? You see, this is flesh talking, not spirit. And the weapons of the flesh are carnal, not spiritual. So he wants a carnal weapon. Well, David knew very well that there was one special weapon at Nob. Verse 9, the priest said, Well, David, the sword of Goliath the Philistine whom thou slewest in the, in the valley of Elah. Behold, it's here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt, take that, take it. For there is no other save that here. And David said, hmm, there's none like that. Give it me. There's none like that. One of the great understatements of the Old Testament. The fact is that there was no more awesome weapon in all of Israel than this sword. But David's rattled, you see. He shouldn't be asking for this. But he doesn't know what to do because he did not expect to see Saul's spy in the very heart of the ecclesia. And so alarming was the fact that the enemy was present in the very sanctuary of God that he acts in desperation, you see. If there can be no refuge with the high priest, there can be no refuge in the country. Psalm 11 verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And so he panics, you see. This is what's going through the mind of David. He panics in this situation and asks for a sword. And I think, you see, it was at this moment that the thought came into David's mind. I mean, this sword is too big to use for a normal man. And I'm aware that David was a physically capable man, but this sword would probably weigh 10 kilograms. A normal sword would weigh two or three kilograms. 
Think about a builder using a hammer that's too big for him. He can do the first nail, he can do the second nail, but how, how would you be after half a day? He couldn't lift the thing off the ground, and it would be the same here. David could wield this, but this would be hopeless for him in any prolonged combat. Too large a sword to be of use to any normal man. David was powerful, but not that powerful. But can you see the plan emerging? I'll go to the Philistines. I'll return to them the sword of Goliath of Gath. And I'll fall upon the mercy of the Philistines because in Israel, I'm a dead man walking. Look at the extremity of it. Verse uh, verse 10. David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David, the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? I don't think David went to the Philistines in disguise. It would have been pointless. He was far, far too well known. I mean, they, they know of the songs that Israel sang celebrating David's victories. They call David the king of the land. He's not the king of the land. He's clearly the next king of the land. They could all see the writing on the wall. Don't bother with the disguise. It will only go against you if you try and trick them. So he presents himself to the gates of Gath and is immediately placed under arrest. They all knew this was the next king of Israel, as I said. They all knew what David could do if he had an army. Do the Philistines trust him? (laughs) No. Not one bit do they trust him. So David's just leapt out of the fry pan into the fire. He really has. And there's a powerful lesson here, you know, for you and me. I've heard it said, More than once I've heard it said that the ecclesia's too hard. It's a hard place. Perhaps it's an unloving place. I'll get more sympathy in the world than I do in the ecclesia. Don't fool yourself. You'll never find solace in the world. Whatever the problems are that come upon us, you'll never find solace in the world. And I say that lesson now particularly because it may be that because of the peculiar circumstances that are confronting us now in life, we have more to do with our colleagues in the world than we do with our brothers and sisters in the ecclesia. It may be that if you're working from home or something, that that's your situation. The fact is the ecclesia does let us down from time to time. And when that happens, we've got to turn to God, not to the world. Or perhaps ask yourself if you haven't brought it upon yourself, but, you know, turn to God not the world, and doors will open. The world will never give you the right answer. And this is what David's going to find out here. He's turned to the world because he thought the ecclesia had let him down or that the ecclesia was somehow compromised because Doeg was in the very heart of the ecclesia. This is a disaster, this decision. Verse 12. David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid. There's our word. He was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. That's the basis in verse 12 here. This is the basis of Psalm 34, verse 4. I sought Yahweh, and he delivered me from all my fears. This is the fear of man. And it's not just a fear of man in verse 12. He was sore afraid. He was utterly terrified because of what man might do to him. As I mentioned earlier, David wasn't a man normally given to fear. So the fact that he's sore afraid here is very significant because this is the only time you'll find in Scripture David was ever afraid of man. And he's afraid of man in the arms of the Philistines at this moment. And of course, David's plan fails. The Philistines are not inclined to give him asylum. They're not impressed with him bringing back the sword of Goliath. They do not trust him. I think they think he's every bit as likely to be a spy as he is to be a fugitive. And the only way to find out why David's really here is going to be to interrogate him. And that interrogation is going to be physical. So think about what that would mean. What would the Russians do if you presented yourself on their doorstep in the kind of way David does? having the kind of reputation that David does. And so David descends into carnal methods. Once again, verse 13, he changed his behavior. 
before them. He feigned himself mad in their hands. He scrabbled on the doors of the gate. He let spit fall down his beard. Brothers and sisters, this is the man after God's own heart. Without God. Reduced to an animal. He's lost all human dignity in verse 13. But he doesn't know what to do, you see. And then the miracle. Verse 14. Then said Achish to his servants, Lo, you see here the man is mad. Wherefore then have you brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that you've brought this fellow to play the, mad, mad, the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Okay. Did Achish really believe David was mad? Jewish tradition accounts for that statement by the comment that there was madness in Achish's own family and that Achish had compassion on mad people. <laughs> Perhaps. It's certainly true that Achish uses David's madness as a pretext for his release. But if you were Achish, what would you do? Why would you take the risk releasing David? Whether he's mad or not, why wouldn't you just kill him? Achish. He's an Israeli spy. Well, maybe. Achish. He's Israeli special forces. Just get rid of him. And don't you think there'd be many, many people in the city of Gath wanting just that? Just kill him. I mean, what do you think Goliath's own family felt about David's presence in Gath? What do you think Goliath's family felt when Achish released David and sent him away? So why did Achish let David go at the end of verse 15 of chapter 21 of 1 Samuel? I don't think David was at all convincing in his madness. But I do think he convinced the Philistines of one thing, that the breach between him and Saul was irreparable. And Achish probably sent David back into the land hoping that he would cause a civil war. But think about this from Achish's point of view. Achish has now got to make a political... He doesn't care about David. He really doesn't. But he's got to make a political decision. Option one, kill David. Well, what could happen if we kill David? Well, we risk an Israeli uprise against us. David was famous in Israel. They loved him back in Israel. We could kill the next king of Israel, and all of a sudden, we're going to get invaded by Israel. That's a possibility. Or we could release David to try and incite a rebellion in Israel. It's clear that Saul hates him. It's clear that he hates Saul. Well, that could work. And then if there is an uprising within Israel and perhaps a civil war in Israel, David's definitely going to win that war. He is the next king. And if we've released him, well, then we've just got a very helpful neighbor. He owes us something. So you can imagine Achish talking to the other lords of the Philistines about this because <laughs> the other cities of the Philistines would know that David was in prison in Gath. And he's going to have a story for them. And he's going to have a story for his own people. And Achish goes with the story that it's going to be more politically expedient to release David because of what the future might hold between them than it is to kill him. That might explain, by the way, why, why Achish uh, later has David back in 1 Samuel 27 because he thinks they're allies. Uh, in chapter 27, of course, David comes on his own terms. He's leading an army. But Achish is happy to employ him because Achish is looking to the future, relations between Israel and the Philistines. Well, the upshot of it all is that David's released. And in chapter 22, verse 1, it says that David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. And it's the end of verse 2 of 1 Samuel 22, we believe that David sat down and wrote Psalm 34. And it was in that cave, therefore, that the psalm would have had its first recital. Verses 1 to 10, 
David's experience. Verses 11 to 22 of the psalm, David's instruction in front of 400 discontented men. But I'll show you something interesting. Now think about this. Listen to me carefully. If you want to know David's thoughts behind 1st of Samuel 21, you would go to Psalm 34. Psalm 34 is David's memoir of the events of 1 Samuel 21. That's true. What if you want to know David's thoughts behind Psalm 34? Where would you go then? So let's be clear. What am I saying? If you want to know David's thoughts behind 1 Samuel 21, you'd go to Psalm 34. Where would you go if you want to know David's thoughts behind Psalm 34? If you want to go back one step further, well, the answer is, I think, you'd go to Psalm 56. Come with me to Psalm 56. I think these are the thoughts behind Psalm 34, which in turn are the thoughts behind 1 Samuel 21. Look at this. Psalm 56. Let's start with the superscription. A miktam, or an engraving, or a poem of David when the Philistines took him in Gath. The word took means to grab or to seize or to possess. I think this is the background to the events of Psalm 34 and therefore the events of 1 Samuel 21. This is another psalm of those times. Uh, this is a psalm, however, that speaks directly about David's confinement in prison in Gath. This is what led David to pretend to be mad. Look what happened to him. Verse 1. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He, fighting, daily oppresseth me. Rotherham says, all the day a fighter oppresseth me. So this is the guard who was responsible for extracting the truth from David. Why are you here? Why did you come? What do you mean by bringing that sword? Tell me the truth. This too. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. My enemies, the margin says, my observers. So this is the interrogation. Verse 5, every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They certainly didn't give David the benefit of the doubt in Gath. Verse 6, they gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. They waited for his soul. He really believes he's going to die in a Philistine prison. The interrogators are violent. They do not believe him. They're looking for the real reason he's come. And he can't convince them. And so he pretends to be mad, you see. He really thinks he's going to die. You want to, you want to see that? Look at verse 13. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt thou not deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the, in the light of the living, he says? Well, there's the deliverance in verse 13. There's the theme of deliverance that you met in Psalm 34. So Psalm 56 has got the same theme of deliverance as Psalm 34 does. And this, of course, is what led David to think his case was hopeless. He really thought he was going to die because the interrogator wanted to kill him. One word from Achish and David would have been dead. That's why he feigned madness. Verse 8, Thou tellest my wanderings, he says. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Can you see the anguish of David? Madness by day. Tears by night. The book here, is our chairman referred to in his opening prayer. This is a reference to the day book, the companion book to the book of life. The book of life is the record of all those who will be in the kingdom of God. From the foundation of the world, it's recorded the names of all those who would be called to the truth, whether they respond or not, whether they're faithful or not. The faithless and the unbelievers have their names removed from the book of life. The day book, which is this book here, is the intimate diary that God keeps of every one of us. Our tears, our fears, the trials we undergo, our responses to trial, our innermost thoughts, everything we say, everything we think, 
and why. It's the basis of the judgment seat, isn't it? And in the depths of despair, David's mind goes back to his Bible. He's got nothing left. All the ingenuity of man, as capable as he might have been himself, is failing him. But it was this very situation, you see, that led him back to God. Because verse 10 says, In God will I praise his word. In Yahweh will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. And there's the next link with Psalm 34. Psalm 34 verse 4. This is the fear of man that Psalm 34 speaks about. And so fear and deliverance are both themes of Psalm 56 as they were of Psalm 34. You read of David's fear in verse 11 and his deliverance in verse 13. The twin themes that we described of Psalm 34. This is the background to Psalm 34. Just as Psalm 34 is the background to 1 Samuel 21. And David concludes in verse 11, well, I'm no longer afraid of man. I'm in this situation, in jail in the Philistine, in the Philistine city. They're going to do with me whatever they do with me. There's nothing I can do to get out of here. If I die, I die. I'm in the hand of God. And then verse 13 says, they has delivered me, my soul from death. The door opens. The man's mad. Why have you brought him to me? What do I need any more madmen? Send them away. And unbelievably, the door's opened and he walks straight down in 1 Samuel 22 to the cave of Adullam. And that brings us now back to Psalm 34. What did he do when he got to the cave of Adullam? Well, he gave those 400 men a lesson like they'd never heard in their lives. And you can see why. Psalm 34, verse 3. Oh, magnify Yahweh with me. Let us exalt his name together. He's talking to 400 men in a cave, as he says, verse 3. Verse 4. I sought Yahweh, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. And after those weeks, perhaps months, in a Philistine prison, he finally gives up. He finally stops spitting on his bed and scraping at the door with his fingernails, and he turns to the only solution that there ever really was. But you notice the critical point of verse 4. God only acted when David sought him. David had to seek him first for God to act in verse 4. And it's a major principle of Scripture, you know. Second of Chronicles 15, verse 2. Yahweh is with you while you be with him. If ye seek him, he will be found of you. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. So God calls us to the truth. It's our duty to respond to that call. If we leave aside the principles of the truth and decide to walk alone, decide to seek solutions in the world outside of the boundaries of the truth, God will not walk with us. But the moment we return to God, he returns to us. Think of the prodigal son. The father never, ever went out to the pig pen to retrieve the son, but he always looked for him. Every morning he scanned the horizon looking for the shadow of this boy in the distance. And when he finally one day saw that son in the distance, he ran to meet him, but he would never go into the city to find that son. If we return to God... He'll make up the distance between him and us. But if we insist on walking in our own strength, like David originally did, he will leave us in a Philistine jail. It's an amazing thing. But you want to see the power of that lesson? Look at verse 5. They looked unto him and were lightened. Their faces were not ashamed. That's the 400 men at David's feet sitting there motionless and silent and listening to every word that drops from his lips. And where is David when he says it? Of course, he's in the cave of Adullam, 1 Samuel 22, high up in the Judean hills. And if you were to stand at the cave of Adullam and look out, you look straight down towards the valley of Elah, the place where the whole story began, the place where he first killed Goliath only to end up in Goliath's own hometown and be delivered from there. It's really the story of Elah to Elah. 
And this psalm is the conclusion of it all. David's life from Elah to Elah and all the troubles in between. Wow, does he ever have a story to tell as he recites this story to those 400 men. And you can imagine, David, men, I know why you're here. I don't have to be a mind reader. I think the same things as you. You've come here because you want to put Saul's head on the end of your sword. I understand. I know how you feel, but I'm telling you, that's not the right answer. If God wants him dead, he'll be dead by morning. If God wants you dead, you'll be dead by morning. And let me tell you, I know that for a fact. Because every day, week after week, I was in a Philistine jail, not knowing whether I'd see the next day. So God's plan is going to be outworked with every one of us. And you want to see the proof of that? Look at verse 20 of the psalm. He keepeth all his bones and not one of them's broken. In a simple sense, that verse is an explanation of God's providential care. When David died, he was buried in Jerusalem, 2 Kings 2 verse 10. When Saul died, they decapitated him they nailed his body to the wall of Beth Shan. The men of Jabesh Gilead came and retrieved it, burned it, and buried his bones under a tree in 1 Samuel 31. So not one of David's bones was broken. He was buried intact. Every single one of Saul's bones was broken. He was buried in, it in bits. But even more significantly, of course, verse 20 is quoted of the Lord Jesus Christ, in John 19, verse 36. In trying to discredit him in the psalm, the Pharisees tried to get Pilate to break his legs. John 19, verse 31. But the centurion found him dead already. And so instead, they pierced his side, thereby fulfilling two prophecies, not one. If God wants, it, if God wants David dead by evening, he'll be dead by evening. If he doesn't, he won't. God's will will be fulfilled no matter what. And so there, there are 400 men now at David's feet. Verse 5 says that their faces were not ashamed. And we know something about the faces of those 400 men because 1 Chronicles 12 verse 8 tells us that of the Gadites they were separated unto David into the hold, men of might, men of war, men fit for the battle, whose faces were like the faces of lions. So David's not talking to a Sunday school class here. He's talking to men who've seen battle, men who've taken human life, men who've run for their lives, men who have not known whether they'd still be alive in 24 hours. These are the kind of people he's talking to. But they look to David because he says, don't tell me you've, haven't had, you've had an experience that I haven't had. Let's swap places for a moment and come with me to the Philistine jail. You've got to understand that the boxes that they have in, in Philistia are every bit as capable as we are. And if they want to hurt you, they can hurt you. Trust me, I know what I'm, ta I'm talking about. And 400 pairs of eyes would have looked up at him and thought, Phew, we're lucky he's here. And David says, but there's only one reason I'm here, and it's not because of me. Well, what was David's experience? And the answer is that there are two companion verses here. Verse 6 and verse 8 of the psalm. He says, this is how it was for me. This poor man cried and Yahweh heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The word cried means prayed. The man doesn't cry. The man prays to God and God saves him. And then verse 8. Taste and see that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. This is what he's teaching those men. Taste and see. The word taste means to perceive or to behave or to reason. It's the same word in 1 Samuel 21 verse 13 translated behavior, where David changed his behavior. He changed his perception. He changed his taste before the Philistines. Taste and see that Yahweh is good, he says to these men. Uh, the parallel verse in Psalm 56 would be Psalm 56 verse 10. In God I will praise his word. How do we know that that's what it means? Well, because this verse is quoted in 1 Peter 2 verse 2. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be that you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. 
But I said that these were companion verses, verse 6 and verse 8. Why are they companion verses? Well, it's easy. Look at verse 6. This is us talking to God. And look at verse 8. This is God talking to us. So there's a conversation between verse 6 and verse 8. There's a relationship. And in between those two verses is verse 7. The angel of Yahweh encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Because, of course, it's when you talk to God and God talks to you that you're aware of the greater events of your life and the significance of angelic interactions and providence happening in your life. But it's only when you're in fellowship with God to this degree that you're aware those things even occur. The minute you take things into your own hand, those angels don't disappear, but they do from your consciousness. And you think you're in it by yourself. And you've got to do everything by yourself. And if you can't deliver yourself, you'll die. It's not true. And that's what David found, you see. How conscious are we about the presence of a divine being in our lives, watching everything we do, recording every word in a book, every thought, every action, that it might be discovered when those books are open. How conscious are we of that? Well, David became very, very conscious of it. And so he says in verse 7, Come, ye children, 400 men. Come, ye children, he says, listen to me. I'm going to teach you the fear, the reverence of God. 400 wild men sitting at his feet like a Sunday school class. But if they learn to fear Yahweh, like David learned to fear Yahweh, then they're not, they're not just 400 wild men. Look at verse 9. Oh, fear Yahweh, ye his saints, he says. The saints. Not 400 animals, the saints. Saints are people reserved for God, you see. And what was the fear of God or the reverence of God? The word fear means terror or it means reverence. Strong's concordance has both meanings. So the context determines which one is right. And from the verses that follow, it's clear that the latter is correct. It's talking about the reverence of God here. Well, we made the comment already that verse 8 is quoted in 1 Peter 2 in verse 3. Peter quotes the psalm again in 1 Peter chapter 3. And 1 Peter 3, verses, 8, sorry, verses 10 to 12, quotes Psalm 34, verses 12 to 16. So Peter quotes the psalm twice. The context of Peter's quotation <coughs> in 1 Peter chapter 3 is the ecclesial persecution by Nero in the first century. Nero hunted the ecclesia in a very similar way to what Saul hunted David, from house to house, taking whole families into custody. And in Peter's day, all you had to do was put a pinch of incense on a pagan altar and Nero would let you go free. A very small compromise. But if you did that small compromise, you failed the test. You've taken things into your own hands. David tried compromise, and he learned a vital lesson. He says, don't do it. But Peter quotes these verses in the context of God, godly living. 1 Peter 3 verse 8 begins, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, not rendering evil for evil, not rendering railing for railing. And, so, and he starts to describe the characteristics of the saints. Well, we made the comment at the outset that this psalm is an ideal psalm for a Sunday morning. Why is that? Well, because in 1, Chronic, in 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul tells us to examine ourselves. And what David tells these men here is to examine themselves. He gives them a checklist of saints, of the characteristics of saints, of the characteristics of people who trust God rather than trusting themselves. And here it is. Look at verse 12. Fellas, he says, What man is he that desires life and loveth many days that he might see good? Now, this is not just a reference to living a long and happy life in verse 12. The section concludes in verse 16. The face of Yahweh is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Huh. Just as David said to those men, our conduct in the affairs of life will decide whether there's any remembrance for us in the life to come. 
It was true then. It's true now. But then verse 13, he says, so measure yourself, men, he says. Verse 13, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. It's a very natural thing to speak guile. If you're being persecuted by somebody like Saul, it's an extremely natural thing to, persecute, to, to speak guile. Saul was an unjust man. The persecution was unjust. There was a cause. But saints don't act like that. So do we have a problem with the tongue? Do we often regret the words we speak in haste? I, I dare say I'm as guilty as this as you are. Guile means deceit or treachery. So are we people that others look to and say they can trust? When, when you get asked a straight question, do you give a straight answer? Let your communication be yay, yay, or nay, nay. Any more comes of evil. Verse 14. Depart from evil, do good. Seek peace, pursue it, do good. Do we have God's interest at heart? Or are we more inclined to satisfy our own interests? Do we pursue peace? Or do we find ourselves continually or, or naturally agitating? Now, this can be difficult, of course. Doing good may not allow you to have peace. I mean, David did not pursue war with Saul, but it came to him. So doing good may not allow you to have peace, but you've got to try. Compromising to get peace is not the right answer. You've got to do good. Verse 15. The eyes of Yahweh are upon the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. Well, there's the million-dollar question. Do we cry? The word means pray. Do we cry to God at all? Are we people of fervent prayer, particularly when times are tough? Do we have the relationship between ourselves and God that verses 6 and 8 speak of, where we talk, to, we, we talk to God and God talks to us through his word. How often do we pray? How long do we pray for? What do we pray about? Verse 18. Yahweh is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. And if we do pray, and if we do want God to hear our prayers... We better make sure we've got a humble and a contrite heart. That we're presenting ourselves before God as his servants. That he might change us. But can you see in this David's confession to these men? Oh, he's telling them a story of his life. And he's pulling lessons out of the story that he might teach these men. But can you see woven in here is his own confession? Verse 12. What man is he that desireth life? And here's David in a Philistine jail. Verse 13, keep thy tongue from speaking evil. And there he was, babbling like a madman. Verse 14, depart from evil and do good when he, in fact, turned to the world and not to God in the first instance. God's ear, verse 15, is open to our cry. God certainly heard his cry. He put all David's tears in a bottle, it says in, verse, in Psalm 56. Verse 18, God is near to them of a broken heart. And there's David in his humility before 400 men, bearing his soul to those men and telling them, I got it wrong. I got it wrong. But thanks be to God, I'm here to tell you, I got it wrong. And this is what David worked out when he was in jail, in Gath, not knowing whether he'd stand to live another day, because, you see, this is really the story of Elah to Elah. And that's why, despite his failings, he was still a man after God's own heart. Because at the end of it all, he comes back to the truth and says, you know what? I don't always get it right, but the truth's the truth. And this is where salvation is. And in conclusion, can you imagine, brothers and sisters, the greater than David, a thousand years later, looking over these words, understanding everything we've just said and even more, and reflecting upon these words throughout the troubles of his life when people were hunting him to kill him in just the same way. But he never resorted to the hand of man and simply opened his ear to the commandments of his father morning by morning, even more. Well, that, of course 
is the man who we come to remember now.